Well, good morning, Jubilee Shores. All you heathens getting coffee and biscuits. Come on. Join us other heathens. Welcome, everybody, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we come together for one goal and one purpose, to worship our Lord and Savior, as we are commanded to, both for his glory, but mostly for our own, as we re-nourish ourselves and get fed and hear God's word, sing God's word, and say God's word. So welcome, everybody, to Jubilee Shores United Methodist Church for this time of worship. Uh, my name is Dave. I have the great honor and privilege of being the pastor here. This one executive committee meeting today. That, that was our old church leadership. Now it's called the executive committee. But there were some scheduling conflicts, plus it's uh, crafts weekend. So we have postponed that till April the 3rd um, after service. Now in the past, because of COVID, we haven't really been able to invite the whole church body. But if anybody would like to attend and just see the polity of the church, how we do business, and everything else. Anybody can attend, but you can always offer ideas and ask any questions you might want to do. That's on April the 3rd at 11.30. Um, and, but more fun is in two weeks on April the 1st, and no, I'm not kidding, it's April the 1st, um, we're going to have a, uh, a bonfire party out in the garden. We had one last year. It was a lot of fun. We grilled hamburgers and hot dogs, and we had oysters, and we just... Watch the fire burn. It was quite relaxing and a lot of fun and a lot of great fellowship. So please come, um, bring a chair. Probably turn the grill on around 5, 5.30, and we'll do hamburgers and hot dogs and etc. And as you know, like last time, um, if you want to bring your own adult beverage, feel free. Um, I know there were several of us who did last time as well. But it's a great time, and so I invite you all to come. It's a chance for us to get together outside of just for church. Also, David and Queenie are coming. I thought it'd be kind of cool if more than the five minutes you get on Sundays, you can spend some time with you. So those are my announcements for this morning. As always, beloved, I invite you, I ask you, I, I actually plead with you to just, for this limited time and this limited space, just cast aside the outside world. Just bring yourself here. Be present here. Be centered here and listen for God's word. Expect God to come and touch you. Expect radical changes. Beginning more often, I hope, more if I can remember is, is the reason, um, we're going to join together and recite the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to begin with me inviting us and by describing to us, myself included, the four signs or the four marks of a church. So because we are one holy Catholic universal, not Catholic church, Catholic meaning universal, an apostolic church, those are the this traditional affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. <clears throat> Thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Just to give you an idea of the brain power of your pastor, I have this lighter sitting on my Bible, on the pulpit, to remind me to light the candle, and I still can't do it. Today's Psalter reading is going to be from Psalm 95, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7. Listen to the words of the Lord. Read along as I read to you. This is a call to worship and obedience. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. 
Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it in the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Family Jubilee Shores, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you would either here or part of our online campus, please stand as you are able and clap your hands and stomp your feet and welcome our worship band. Woohoo! Well, good morning, Jubilee Shores United Methodist Church and all you folks joining us in our online campus. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I have some good news for you this morning. Our God is for us. Amen. Because my God is for us, uh, I'm going to take a closer walk with him.
Everybody, we are going to do something a little bit different today. Um, this has been brought up to me for the last few years, and I actually wanted to institute this, but then this thing called COVID came around and kind of threw a wrench into everything. So, but it got brought up again at our churchwide meeting on Sunday. By the way, if you didn't get a chance to, to be part of that, if you are interested, you can go to our uh, webpage and you can watch uh, the live stream there. Um, but starting today, we're going to begin to pass around the offering plate. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, we'll have two people. It's going to change probably week to week. They're going to come up, and they're going to hand a plate to each section, and you guys are just going to put in what your heart tells you to put in there, if anything, and then just kind of pass it back to the row behind you. The last person in the row, they'll get it back from you, and we'll just do it um, that way. So we're going to start doing that. And for right now, we're just trying it out to see how it fits after the second song to be passed around while they're playing the third song. But we might move it. We'll see. We'll just see how it fits. So I just want to let you know what's going on. So Cody and Bill are our inaugural uh, plate passers, and they're going to come up and give one bowl or plate to each section and just take it and pass it back. Thanks, guys. Uh, Pastor Dave is a big fan of uh, a guy named Jimmy Needham, and uh, he did a uh, really cool reworking uh, of an old standard, and uh, so we hope you like it a lot. You're a good dude. Hey, y'all, uh, I want to welcome, y'all show some love, my buddy Brett Gambino <laughs> joining us today. I brought you Music City, uh, 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 Eastern Shore musical royalty uh, today on guitar. So uh, we're, we're proud and happy to have him. Uh, and he's, he's quite a blessing to the band. All right, let's give this one a shot. All right, three, four. 
Thank you for indulging us. As we, uh, as we prepare our minds and our spirits to receive that spiritual food of God from Pastor Dave today, let us, as is our custom, sing and pray together. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you.
Am I on? There we go. Okay. Thank you so much, worship band, and thank you for being part of our family today. We appreciate that immensely. And David, <clears throat> just thank you all for indulging him. Well, I got to thank him for indulging me because I am a big Jimmy Needham fan. He's a kind of a jazzy, bluesy uh, Christian player, and his theology and his wording is just spot on, um, I, I think and feel. So I would invite you to perhaps look him up, Jimmy Needham, N-E-E-D, Ham, Needham. So today, we're going to have, I think, a, a, a continuing series, even though it wasn't meant to be that way, but it sure is turning out to be that way, which tells me it's a God thing. Um, we began um, our Lenten walk together talking about being a, a burst of light, talking about the transfiguration and how Jesus kind of just burst onto the scene as a burst of light. And then last week, kind of playing on those words, we talked about the need for us to be a burst of salt, for we are light and we are salt of the earth. It's interesting, if you haven't been told this or learned this before or caught it yourself, I, I wasn't that smart to catch it myself. I had to be taught this or read it somewhere. It doesn't say you are commanded to be salt and light. It doesn't invite us to be salt and light. Jesus simply says, you are already salt and light. And so today we're going to talk about what it means to be the hands and feet of being salt and light of the world. So we're going to be reading. It's a little bit lengthy, so I do apologize. Uh, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, and we're going to be reading verses 32 through 45. So I would invite you all to rise for our Gospel reading today, staying as you are able. Again, online campus, please feel free and to get yourselves more in the Spirit. I would invite you to stand as well. Luke 6, 32 through 45. Jesus is just in the middle of talking about loving your enemies, everyone's favorite thing to do. <clears throat> if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And the, the prosperity Bible people love that verse. Love that verse. The more you give, the more you get. Yes, but they don't ever go to the next verse, do they? Verse 37, do not judge, or, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. He's on a roll. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? That's one I stumble on quite often. Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of the heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Family, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Please be seated. <clears throat> There's a lot in there, and you could do a sermon on pretty much any one of those verses. I just wanted to give us a broad brushstroke overview of what today's sermon is hopefully going to be about. You know, we read, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, forgive others, don't judge them, don't judge them, don't be a hypocrite, and from the abundance of the heart, bear good fruit. Talking about to live fully, not just to exist, but to live. And in order to live, we must love. And as we love, we live. It's kind of a both and. And in the process of that loving, in the process of that living, we get to help others. Love is not really an action that we do. Rather, love is what and who we are created in the image of God. Which means we're our happiest, most full of joy, and most fulfilled when we love. It's our spiritual DNA. Love is God's meaning. And the love of God was sent to us as Jesus. God's word made flesh. And Jesus is God's way of basically saying, I refuse to give up on my children. I refuse to give up on this world. I refuse to give up on creation. About our love for him growing. He dreams about our relationship with him growing as well. And love at its core, at its foundation, is all about giving. It's all about giving. You can't be in love and not give. It's, it's an impossibility. But the honestly, we give it with wanton abandon. We just give it emptying ourselves into the other, into our neighbor, into our spouse, into our children, whatever it might be, for their benefit, family, not ours. For their benefit. But here's the kicker when it comes to this kind of love. Here's the kicker whenever you're dealing with anything that is holy, giving the most precious gift we have, which is ourselves, we do get something in return. We get to be alive, aliveness again, fully, fully connected and in rhythm and in harmony and in step with God's plan for our lives and God's plan of salvation, whatever that may be. It's not the motivation of why we love, because love is just to love, it's just giving. It's just in Matthew uh, 22, Jesus gives us the two great commandments, shortened, as I often do. Love God with all you got. Love God with everything you have, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then it says, from these hang the law and the prophets. Which is another way of saying, from these hang life. Or better still, maybe, better still, these are yourself. And it's all, 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 all about giving, which is the crux of today's message. But first, let's get a little bit straight, or at least on the same page, or at least you know where I'm coming from. I'm describing or talking about what giving is and what giving is not. First, what giving is not. And sometimes we'll hear people say, you know, give to get. You're giving something to get something. That, that's not the kind of giving that we're talking about. Because if our motivation 
is something less than, something selfish, something for our own gain, no matter how small, then the giving is lessened as well. In fact, I might be so bold to say that it's without looking for repayment, just giving. In a kind of similar vein, I was actually talking with my wife about this this morning, how many of you have heard sermons or talks or whatever where they're trying to raise money or asking for more money and you end up sometimes feeling shame or those kind of talks, those kind of sermons, if you will, they only get at the mechanics of giving. I could sit up here and pound the pulpit all day and, and everybody might give a little bit extra money for just a little bit of a while. That, we're, that's only dealing with the mechanics. And it's typically short-lived. It's been my time or even a many-time thing. It's a life. It's a lifelong process of sacrificing ourselves, again, emptying ourselves for the benefit of other living. And how can we do this, this constant giving, this constant community outreach? Because you can get spent. I mean, I think through COVID, we all had some degree of, of giving fatigue because we were just being hit up for this, this, and this, and this, plus our time, plus we couldn't see people and all this. So how can we help? Well, here's a very quick and easy way. I'll give you one example. Whenever you all go out shopping, just of you, a couple of extra cans a week by the whole church, We'll have that, have that blessing box full of milk kits all the time and no more of us pleading and asking for folks to make special trips. That's living in aliveness. That's living in love. That's living in giving. And that's just one example. That, that, to give you a sounds oxymoronic talking about giving being freeing, but it truly, truly, truly is freeing lifestyle is to work far past, far beyond the simple mechanics of the five W's of life. The five W's of life, if you don't know, are the who, what, when, where, and why. Because that's not what giving is. Giving doesn't ask who. It's much deeper than all that. We need to work towards and get at our soul. The inner person, you'll sometimes hear me say from here. Our spirit, in other words. How? By working towards creating a spirit of generosity. And we can begin, yourselves privately, by asking yourself this question. In his heart. In all of our hearts, we made more generous, myself very much included. The answer is no. You don't trust on God to be the sustainer of everything. And that's why you find it hard to give up your time, your talents, your gifts, your money, whatever it might be. You might want to look into that and find out what it is. Find out why. And you can always come. Do I trust God enough to give away radically? egregiously even. Do I trust God that much? Three things on giving in general, just, just so we can all get from the, from the Bible. Um, first, as I said last week, it is a, a forever event, and I said it earlier this morning. We never stop giving. Second, it is part of our baptismal vows, family. It is, will you be loyal to Christ, to the United Methodist Church, and do all in your power to strengthen her ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And by saying, I will, you have made a covenant. You have made a vow. Remember during um, our sermon series and we covered the second commandment, don't take the Lord's name in vain, and we kind of weaved and walked through the idea at the end of just quite simply let your yes be the road covenants, if you will. And thirdly, giving does include acts of service, no doubt, and definitely prayer and the gift of presence, just being there with people, no doubt about that. 
but not at the exclusion of tithing. So let's discuss the three most commonly referenced forms of giving in the Bible. First and foremost is the tithe, and that is thought to be 10% by various the New Covenant, the New Testament. It's not really commanded so in the New Testament, so I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. It's hard to get 10% these days. And I get that. But I kind of had, at least for me, a, a kind of personal epiphany. How many people in here have seen the movie The Officer and Gentleman? Raise your hand. Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. You can't handle the truth! Yeah. Not that part, but you know what Sorry. It helps if I have the right movie. <laughs> a few good men. Raise your hand. Okay. Remember that scene where... Uh, Tom Cruise's character um, grabs the book out of the, uh, pro the defending attorney's, um, the prosecuting attorney's hands and walks up to the Marine guy and says, hey, show me in this book where it tells you where to go for your food. Remember that scene? And the guy goes, well, you know, we, there isn't. It's not in the book. Well, how do you know where to go if it's not in the book? I just kind of never knew what time, when, where, how to get there. Oh, no, we, we know it all. But it's not in the book. Tithing in the Old Testament was just so matter of fact. It was just so everywhere. It was being done before there was written word. The first story we have in the Bible is back in Genesis with Abraham and a king's name who I cannot pronounce and don't want to try. And he gave the king 10%, tithe 10%, and it goes back further than that. It's just what you did. It was kind of like why their directions to the cafeteria is not in the marine manual. It, everybody just knew to do it. So that's why it's there. Tithe also is often called first fruits. And it's interesting because first fruits for a farmer means the very first initial harvest. When you really don't know what the entire harvest is going to be, you kind of have to guesstimate and give 10% to the storehouses back in those days. That's why it's called and true regarding first fruits. He wrote, first fruits is just a biblical way of saying that you should give first before you do anything else with your money. You should give first before you do anything else with your money. He continues, ready for a truth bomb? Tithing isn't for God's benefit. He doesn't need our money. Instead, tithing is meant for our benefit. Money can do. And secondly, it reminds us to rely on God more fully to meet our needs. He finishes up by saying, technically, the full tithe should go to your church. In fact, supporting the needs of your pastors and staff and the ongoings, the upkeep and what have you. And the giving giving encourages a grateful and generous spirit and can help steer us away from what money can do. It can make us greedy and make it love it too much. And lastly, he says, plus, being outrageously generous is a blast. <laughs> I love that. So tithe is one of the first things in the Bible. Another one you may not be that familiar with, it's not, it's not heard of that often, but it's a free will offering. And I'm going to pick on a couple of people right now. They're probably going to throw chairs at me, but it's pastor's prerogative, so I don't care. Do you know that most every Wednesday night dinner we've had, in addition to being cooked by Elizabeth and others, has also been paid for by Elizabeth and her dear friend D. Saying, here, be part of my bounty. Enjoy, fill yourselves, and then enjoy Pastor Dave's wonderful Bible study. <laughs> that is an example of free will giving. And lastly, alms, <clears throat> A-L-M-S. Again, it's over the 10% time. 
almsgiving as giving to humanity, typically giving to the poor. And almsgiving especially is more inclusive of the idea of acts of service and prayer and presence and everything else. So why is giving so over the moon all important? I could say from my own personal story, parts of which you have money began to take over in a big way. And I was literally killing myself at my dry cleaners, just working and working and working nonstop. You've heard me say before, and I mean this quite seriously, I used to joke with my staff, I cannot wait to work 80 hours a week. It'll be a part-time job. Because I wanted the money. I wanted the boats. I wanted the cars. I wanted to be a big shot. I wanted the lime. Lessons the hard way. It's so important because God first gave to us. And all we're really doing by giving, <laughs> like in all blessings God gives us, the blessing is not meant for you. We are the vessels. We are to pass it along and give it out to anybody else, whether it's money or our smarts or our handy person abilities or our knitting or our sewing or our cooking, whatever. That's how God gave to us, giving us everything to include his only son. Similar to the famous line in the the book of James, show me your works and I'll show you your faith. We could reward that for this pretty easily. Show me how you give and I'll show you how you love. Our hearts are idle factories. Man, we can make idols out of anything, can't we? Now it's some of us, not all of us, because we all different idols. We all worship something. Apple 17's coming out. Got to have it, whatever it might be. Or I got to have the latest car or the latest cookware or whatever it is. It's got to be great. <laughs> got to have the latest thing, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Latest truck, latest gizmo, yada, yada, yada. More, more, more. And it about killed me. I am not kidding. Only way I know to keep that furnace at bay, that idol making furnace in my heart, was developing a generous spirit. Even when I had to sacrifice things I wanted to do or things I wanted to have, I just gave with no thought, no thought of what's in it for me, no thought of repayment. Just give to give. Just give as part of God's kingdom work. Richard Rohr, as you all probably know by now, it's one of my favorite theologians. He wrote, to give and not demand to receive, that is the crossover point to maturity. And folks, I'm by no means mature, (laughs) but I'm making that crossing over. Similar to the former, but this one needs to have its own little spotlight, its own little section, so that We are the masters of money and not the other way around. We don't want to become money's servant, which I was. Believe it or not, Scripture devotes twice as many verses to money as it does to faith and prayer combined. That should tell you it's pretty serious. And Jesus had a pretty good idea of what it might could do and what it would do to we humans who have idol-making hearts. You know the famous line, it's easier for a rich man or a camel to get through the needle's eye than a rich person to get to heaven. Also, about 15% of Jesus' actual words in all the Gospels are about money. 15%. That's more than what he said about heaven 
and hell combined. And when we look at what Jesus said about money, we can see why he thought it was so important. In Luke chapter 12, you'll find, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he saw our relationship to our money in our, in our possessions as an indicator of the quality and depth of our spiritual lives. If you want to understand how someone behaves, and you've heard me say this countless times, if you want to find out why someone behaves the way they do or how they behave, what their motives are, what their priorities are, follow the money. Last time I said that, go home and look at your checkbook and see where all your money goes, and you'll find out what you worship. One of you actually did. <laughs> Scared the crud out of me. And we had a nice long conversation. Changed things around for him. See, giving's a spirit thing. It's not a monetary thing. It's not a presence thing. It's, it, it's, a, it's a spirit thing. What kind of a spirit do you have in you, and how much do you trust God? Tag along with that. How much do you trust your church to do what is stewardship-wise, what is best with your monies for the church and for the community? So I'm going to ask you, think about your level of giving, and now I'm talking about money. But also think about it in general. With everything you have, all the gifts that you have, everything that God has given you, but especially to the church. But especially to the church. See, last week during our church-wide meeting, we heard Bill Cummins present the numbers. And while they could definitely use improving, they're not bleak. You know, we're not going to close tomorrow or even next month or next months. There's nothing that can't be remedied. And Bill being Bill, being a numbers cruncher, just figured out the number of people who give in the church and did the math and everything else. I can't do it, but he can. And basically, he, he challenged us, told us that if we want to keep going as a church in the long term, that every person who gives needs to increase their monthly giving by $185. I'm going to be a little more bold. In the Bible, we are told, we are exampled to by the patriarchs and heroes of the Bible, to tithe or give 10% to the church. And you've heard me say before that um, through study after study, year after year, that number is just not being reached. Believe it or not, about 80% of people who attend church don't tithe anything. And I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not being judgmental. That, that's just what it is. That's between them and God. And of the remaining roughly 20%, 22%, the, act, the, the average tithe is about 2.5%, not 10 which is tough. I mean, I get it. It's tough. So I'm going to challenge the church. In addition to the 50 new members in 50 days from Easter to Pentecost, I'm going to add this to the challenge list. And again, we're working towards trying to create a joyfully generous spirit, not one of drudgery like, oh, good Lord, not again. I'm going to challenge each of us not for 10%, but what about half that? What about 5%? And if you're like me, you're thinking, does that mean gross or net? <laughs> That's up to you. But you know what? If every person who comes to this church tithe just 5%, even of their net income, now those of you giving 10% or more don't stop. <laughs> so, reminds, me, reminds me of a joke. There's these two people that get uh, cast away. It's 11 o'clock. Cast away on an island, and the one guy's pacing back and forth, nervous as all get out. The other guy is kind of like sitting down, catching a few rays, not worried at all. And the guy is real nervous, goes, man, aren't you frightened? Aren't you worried? I mean, we got no water. We got no food. We're going to die out here. And he just calmly goes, no, I make about 10000 a week, and I'm a 12% tither. Believe me, my pastor will find me. 
<laughs> but what about 5%? Seriously. So I want you to think about that. Pray about that. that that's the ask. It's only an invitation. There is freedom. I can tell you, trust me on this, there's freedom in giving, even when it seems reckless, even when it seems, Dave, I can't tithe, Dave. I got $110,000 of student loans or whatever it might be. Remember what David Ramsey said? It's giving before you do anything else because that's how generous God is with us. And that's what it is to trust God, our generous God, who provides everything and is the sustainer of everything. Now, please don't take that as some prosperity notion that if you give 5%, oh, good Lord, the lottery is going to come, and you're going to open that mailbox, and you're going to have all kinds of cash. I'm not saying that never would and never will. We're talking about a deeper freedom, a divine freedom, a joyous freedom that money and possessions cannot buy. That is what it means for us to be the salt and the light of the world with hands and with feet. I know no one likes talking about money. I promise you my very first sermon or sermons here that we're going to have talks about it because it's just a reality. It's what it is, like it or not. So my challenge is that. Consider 5%. And in two Sundays, we're going to have pledge cards here. They're going to be anonymous, but we've got to work on our budget. And because tithing has tanked, as with every non-charitable uh, corporation in the world with COVID, we've got to know where we stand. And we have no idea. So we, I really am begging you to fill out these pledge cards. Again, they're anonymous. But we've got to start somewhere with a realistic budget. How much money are we going to have to be the light and salt of the world for our community? So those will be here in two weeks. I ask you to take these two weeks and pray about it. And if you have any questions, as always, call me. Giving. I'm sorry, living. Sorry, love is life and is life giving amen we're going to have an abbreviated communion service i didn't realize i was taking that long i apologize on the night in which he was betrayed <clears throat> jesus took the bread And he broke it. And he gave it to you as disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave the cup once again to you as disciples and said, Take, drink, all of you. This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so, Almighty God, we come before you asking that these humble gifts of juice and bread be made into the body and blood of Christ. For one reason only, dear God, so that we can give him away. So that we can be the light of the world, shining his light, the salt of the world, affirming and lifting up and protecting those who need lifting, affirming, and protecting in his name. Please make them into the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world, the body made clean and redeemed by his blood. And we come before you, Father. We come before you, Son. We come before you, Holy Spirit. In unity as one family, reciting the Lord's Prayer, the perfect prayer, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Mona would come up in the band. Uh, we are doing by intention. If you, sh- you should have been offered a, a cup when you came in. If you would like a communion cup instead of coming up for intention, which is totally fine, just raise your hand and Bill will come around over there with the Whitsons and the Walkers. Hey, I'm getting the names right, folks. <laughs> Well, if this side would be willing to come up into the center row, and then this section, and then I guess Rob will be one of the last ones. You guys up that far side can come on over and start making your way this way as well. Surely the presence 
of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Would you stand and sing that with me? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. sisters, we love you. We invite you to go out in this world, be the salt and light that you are created to be, and share your generosity this week. Go in peace. And stack a chair on your way out. <laughs>